Jimmy Ware. Good morning, thank you. Um, well, it's really hard to see. I wonder if you could bring the house lights up a bit, if that doesn't mess up the camera or whatever. It's more fun to see people. I'm actually not a very serious speaker, so if I can see you, I'll know if you're enjoying yourselves. Um, yeah, so I've had quite a trip getting here. Um, as you've heard, uh, you know, I took the 24 hour uh, bus ride. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't in the Fox bus, which seemed like the Lady Gaga rock and roll bus. Um, instead, I was in the ordinary bus, which was actually uh, quite nice. It was a lot of fun watching Tarantino movie and so forth. Um, but it's been really, uh, it's really amazing and remarkable that uh, you've all made it here. I mean, I've, we've never seen anything uh, quite like this. Um, I was saying, you know, I think you've misunderstood what these things are for. You're supposed to be under them to protect you from the axe. But, uh, well, anyhow. Um, this is actually uh, a gorgeous picture. One of the things that people don't really know um, about Wikipedia is that we do have a very large collection of Wikimedia Commons of really astonishing photography that people have donated to the project. Um, this is our friendly uh, volcano uh, in Iceland, actually. Uh, this photo is from about, uh, I think it was from 2004, um, a little more peaceful back then, and not disrupting all of Europe. Uh, but I, just, I looked at it this morning because it was quite uh, enjoyable. So just to get started here, <clears throat> this is a picture. Um, unfortunately, this is not a picture of me. I, I really wish it, it were. Um, I have my mother tasked with finding a suitably similar dorky picture of me uh, with a television back in the day. But it's meant to illustrate, uh, when I was a child uh, and, and we were watching television, uh, I was the remote control. My father would say, Simon, change the channel, and I have to get up and change the channel and come and sit back down. And at the time we had, uh, we had three channels, uh, four if the weather was right, but we, we only had three different uh, channels that we could watch. Uh, and so the process of watching television and what you did with television was very, very simple. Um, later on, we had um, uh, the VCR. My mother was a, a gadget freak, still is a gadget freak, so we had a very early Betamax. So now we had uh, remote control, we were able to watch more uh, different programs. Uh, and now I had a different uh, job in the family. Uh, my mother would say, son, hook up the VCR. So I would have to go and and hook up the VCR. Well, this is, uh, this is where we were in the 80s. Now, fast forward to today. Um, this is uh, when my daughter was born. Uh, she's nine years old now. I got a TiVo, uh, a digital video recorder. And uh, this is one of the setup screens from the current TiVo. Um, and just to give you an idea of how much more complicated life is today, you should just take a read of this. It says, how do you want the TiVo DVR to obtain an IP address? And you've got two lovely choices. You can get automatically from the DHCP server, which is typical. Or let me specify a static IP address, right? Ah, oh, which do I choose? I have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, fortunately, uh, my daughter is now nine, and so she has a role in the house, which is Kira. Please program the TiVo for me. So life goes in cycles. But the point of this is, as our technology for consuming television, and in fact, our technology for consuming all kinds of media, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, has become more sophisticated, become more complicated, uh, culture itself is getting smarter. And this is something that a lot of people are surprised to hear, because it's very conventional to uh, assume that the entire world is going downhill, people are getting dumber all the time. Uh, but in fact, if you step back and reflect on what has happened in our culture, uh, this is not true at all. Uh, if we go back and look at TV comedies, for example, this is I Love Lucy, a great classic show, really funny, but very basic, very simple plots, uh, very simple humor. Later on, we had Mary Tyler Moore, a large ensemble cast, um, more of a, a complicated, drama, a complicated comedy that dealt with social issues, all the way up to Seinfeld, which was quite famously a very complex show, including one episode where all of the scenes were shown in reverse order, and we actually had to watch it very carefully to even understand what was going on. Um, in other areas, uh, TV crime dramas, we went from uh, Dragon Man, which was a very simple cops and robbers, uh, you know, the FBI is trying to find a bank robber. Later on, Hill Street Blues, again, a large ensemble cast, uh, to finally The Sopranos, which had an enormous cast, uh, many, many different storylines, many different intertwined plot lines, 
And in fact, uh, a kind of uh, interesting moral ambiguity that you would have never seen in an earlier program. Uh, in the Sopranos, you often find yourself uh, rooting for Tony uh, because he's a really lovable guy and a mass murderer, but, you know, details. Um, and you would have never seen that kind of thing in the older show. It's a very simple moral outlook and a very simple uh, kind of view. I don't even need to talk about uh, computer gaming, uh, how much more complicated things have gotten here. Uh, Pong was a really great game. Not much of a plot. <laughs> very basic. Later on, we had things like Doom and Quake, uh, where you're fighting monsters and the games have gotten more complicated. And then today we have World of Warcraft. World of Warcraft has over 11 million people playing online. And what's interesting about Warcraft is that it is an incredibly social game. So the real point of Warcraft is not fighting monsters and so forth. It's about a community of people who get together and do things together. Uh, they form guilds and they go out on missions and, and uh, it's really all about that social structure. And so it's significantly more subtle, complex, ethical, moral, um, all kinds of interesting things come into play. So as a result, um, what we're seeing is that some of the ways that we uh, learn about culture and the ways we interact with culture have changed. So no longer do we simply uh, just open up the TV guide to find out what time I Love Lucy is coming on. Uh, now for a show like Lost, uh, we have something called Lostpedia. So how many people here know the show Lost? Okay, so good, everybody basically. Um, and so as you know, Lost is probably one of the most complicated uh, TV shows ever made. It has dozens and dozens of characters, a uh, very complicated storyline. Uh, many, many things are, are mysteries and hidden. And at Wikia, which is uh, my for-profit company, we have a site called Lostpedia. Uh, and this is just to illustrate the way uh, people are interacting with the, with the culture. So Lostpedia is the ultimate uh, encyclopedia of Lost. So it's a place where the super fans, the people who are absolutely fanatic about Lost, can go and write about the show. So five years ago, what they would have done, they would have all gotten together on a message board and they would have talked to each other. Uh, these early adopters, very key influencer people, they would talk to each other on message boards, and often in a jargon language that only they would understand after some time. Whereas today, what they're doing is they're coming together and they're creating a resource that's available and accessible to ordinary fans. And they're very aware that they're writing for people who are fans but don't know as much as they do. So they're really, they're shimon. This community, has, uh, in the past few years, they've written 5,794 articles about loss. So I want you to think for a moment about what this means and the depth of this content. I'm not talking about 5,794 message board posts or comments. Uh, that would number into the, to the thousands or probably millions by now. These are individually written articles, much like a Wikipedia entry, about every possible aspect of the show. So if, for example, in Lost, if you see a character reading a particular book, you can be assured that in Lostpedia there will be an entry about that book, which will explain how that book ties to that character and to the broader plot. And we're trying to figure out the show, it's very, very complicated. What's interesting about this for me is that this is not a one-way process. The, the complexity of Lost is made possible in part by Lostpedia and by the internet community. The J.P. Abrams, who's the creator of the show, is a huge fan of Lost TV, and they actually use it to make sure that everything that they're doing is within canon. Uh, they know that the fans know what they've done in the past better than they know, even. Uh, and so they're able to create a much more rich, compelling, complicated uh, TV experience in which the entire universe that they're working in uh, can be kept more or less consistent um, with multiple timelines, all kinds of crazy stuff they've done in the show. Uh, and this is something that would have never, not been possible before. So how do we get here? Um, and so, you know, where do we get, how do we get to the point that we have a Lostpedia with almost 6,000 articles? So Wikipedia was the great experiment. Uh, Wikipedia started in 2001, uh, and uh, Wikipedia started with a very radical idea. Um, Charles Van Doren, who was later a senior editor at Britannica, said, uh, the ideal encyclopedia should be radical, it should stop being sick. But if you know the history of Britannica since 1962, it's been anything but radical. Britannica is still a very safe, old-fashioned encyclopedia project. Wikipedia, on the other hand, began with a very radical idea, and that's for all of us to imagine a world in which every single person on the planet is given free access to the sum of all human knowledge. That's what we're doing. So every piece of this uh, vision statement uh, has a critical meaning and is very important. 
Um, and I'll go through some of these details so that you understand it. So first of all, what is Wikipedia? Um, so I used to always ask, how many people here have used Wikipedia? Which is everybody. Um, so now, uh, since that's not a very interesting question anymore, the real question is, how many people here have actually edited Wikipedia? Oh, a handful, not, not that many. Um, I just was recently speaking at a high school in London, and I got about 60% of the kids uh, in the school raised their hand that they had edited Wikipedia at some point, which I thought was very interesting. So for people who simply use Wikipedia, if you've just come to Wikipedia, you, you typed into a search engine something you were interested in, and you came to Wikipedia, uh, people usually, uh, they have some idea of how it works, but they don't really know some of the ideas behind Wikipedia. So I want to go through some of that very quickly. So I always talk about free access to the sum of all human knowledge. Uh, Wikipedia is a freely licensed encyclopedia. Uh, so what do I mean by freely licensed? I mean free in the sense of open source software, free software, if you're familiar with those concepts. The idea here is that for Wikipedia, and for all of the work in Wikipedia, including all of our software, uh, you have the freedom to copy it, you can modify it, you can redistribute it, you can redistribute modified versions, and you can do all of these things commercially or non-commercially. So when people put things into Wikipedia, they aren't just contributing to this one humanitarian project. If you're contributing to a storehouse of knowledge, which can then be repurposed and reused by anybody for anything. And this empowers an amazing uh, amount of energy within our community, and it empowers all kinds of interesting projects all around the world, as people are taking Wikimedia content and repurposing it for educational purposes, entertainment purposes. They can do anything that they want with it. Um, don't even have to ask us permission. What is the sum of all human knowledge? Uh, when we talk about Wikipedia, we talk about uh, what it is, uh, there's a famous page uh, amongst Wikipedians in Wikipedia called What Wikipedia Is Not. Uh, one of the most important things about Wikipedia is that it is an encyclopedia. It's not a library, not an archive, not a textbook. Um, we're not YouTube, so we don't have funny cat videos. Um, I love funny cat videos, uh, but they don't belong in Wikipedia. In fact, there are lots and lots of things that don't belong uh, in Wikipedia, and that focus on the concept of encyclopedia is part of what has allowed our community to be successful. They have a very clear idea of what it is they're trying to accomplish, um, and they stick very, very strongly to that original goal of creating an encyclopedia. So how global is Wikipedia? Um, we have this grand ambition to be in all the languages of the world. Uh, we want a free encyclopedia for everyone. Um, and we're succeeding in that to some extent. It's an interesting thing to look at. So we now have over 3 million articles in English, um, which is the largest project. Uh, but we also have over half a million German, French, Polish, Japanese, Italian, Dutch, Spanish, and Portuguese. Um, so uh, as you can see, we're very strong in all of the European languages. Uh, the Germans actually have over a million entries now. Um, and so we're very strong in, in the European languages, including the Northern European languages. We're strong in Japanese. Um, and we're strong in Chinese. Uh, we have over 300,000 entries in Chinese. So this is an interesting one, and I'm going to talk more about China later, because I wanted to talk a little bit about the impact of these new technologies on uh, democracy and freedom of speech, and how we are uh, basically approaching that whole set of issues. Um, so the Chinese Wikipedia, just keep in mind, it's quite large, over 300,000 entries, even though we were completely banned in China for three years. But we'll come back to that. So how popular is Wikipedia? Um, well, we're the sixth most popular in Germany, seventh most popular in the US, uh, ninth most popular in India, tenth most popular in Japan, um, and yet we're only the 62nd most popular in China. Again, this is a direct result of having been banned in China for, uh, for three years straight. Uh, so we, we really got behind in China. Also, uh, Baidu copies all of our content uh, and publishes it under basically Bidenpedia. Um, it says all rights are sort of Baidu at the bottom, which is interesting, but uh, this is China. Um, so, uh, uh, so anyway, we, we are very global, but once we get outside of uh, the major languages that I mentioned, things are much smaller. Uh, we have uh, languages, uh, all the languages of India, we have projects started, but the largest one we have is around 50, 60,000 articles. Um, in Africa, we only have three languages in Northern Africa. We have Kiswahili, we have uh, Afrikaans, which is actually old Dutch, it's a colonial language. And uh, we have now Wolof, uh, is our third language, the language of Senegal, which now has over a thousand entries. All of the other languages of Africa have less than one thousand entries. So although we have a very broad vision of where we want to get, we're a long way from getting there, uh, particularly in the developing world, and that's becoming more of a focus for us. 
So, uh, and the second video is just the beginning. Um, when I think about, <coughs> sorry, I have allergies and I really hope I'm going to have a coffee today, but so far so good. So, um, <coughs> when I think about my work more broadly, when I think about participatory culture, um, what I'm trying to do is basically bring in a new age of media in which everyone has the possibility to participate, and not just participate in the sense of randomly putting up a Twitter comment or a blog post or something like this, but actually participate in building something important and meaningful to them. Um, and so for this, the encyclopedia was just the beginning. Um, when you go to a traditional library um, and, you, and you go and say, I'd like to see the encyclopedia, please, they'll bring you to a set of books about this big on the shelf. Um, and that's the encyclopedia. But if you think about the library, the library is much, much bigger. Uh, and this is what we're doing at Wikia, which is my new company. So at Wikia, we're uh, allowing people to build every kind of community, every kind of book or work that people want to build. Um, and we're seeing very similar growth to what we saw at Wikipedia in the early days. So in our 36 months since launch, we got to 600 million page views. Wikipedia was at 800 million. So Wikipedia was growing a little faster, uh, but we're doing very well. Uh, we're currently uh, 72nd most popular uh, website, this is according to Quantcast, um, and our traffic's been doubling every year. So we're doing very, very well, um, and uh, we're, we're very pleased about that. And we're, the community at Wikia, they're creating a new wiki every six minutes. So there's this huge rush of people, and they're just beginning all of these amazing projects. Almost any movie, book, uh, video game, uh, TV show, series of books, uh, celebrity, People are coming and beginning to start their own uh, encyclopedia. Every uh, kind of political movement, every kind of, uh, we have a, a, a wiki about pet diabetes, as you can imagine. Uh, apparently pets have diabetes and it's a big problem for people and we get together and share information. So this is going on kind of bubbling under the surface of the internet. I don't think it's really clear to people's consciousness yet, but all of these hundreds, uh, you know, hundreds of thousand wikis, they're all growing very quickly and we're going to see something really amazing happening. Already our traffic rivals uh, that of the New York Times. So keep in mind, this is Wikipedia, which you've probably never heard of before today. Not Wikipedia. Wikipedia's traffic is dramatically higher than the New York Times for many years now. Um, and so what's interesting is when we think about how people are consuming media, um, it's really changing. And one of the interesting things is how quickly uh, brands can be built today. Wikipedia is now a global brand. People know it everywhere I go. Um, everyone on the internet knows Wikipedia. Now, not everybody's on the internet yet, but everybody who's on the internet knows Wikipedia. And our total spending for marketing is essentially zero. Um, it all grew by word of mouth, it all grew by putting together something of quality that people care about. Um, and at Wikipedia, we're trying to do the same thing. So now I'm going to go back and I'm going to talk a little bit more about China, and then I'm going to talk about our, our impact around the world. Uh, I think China is an interesting case uh, because China is um, a huge market and they're um, uh, really one of the most important places uh, on the internet. The number of uh, internet users in China is now approximately equal. I haven't seen the latest number, but it's, it's very close to the number of internet users in the United States and is, is going to pass very quickly. Um, so it's the largest uh, number of users. In our Chinese language version of Wikipedia, we have 302,000 articles, but the internet is censored in China. Uh, the internet uh, is heavily censored in China, uh, and this is something that we've always uh, struggled with. Uh, we are now the 62nd most popular site in China, uh, primarily because we were banned for three years. So unlike Google, uh, we decided a long time ago that because Wikipedia is a charity, uh, because Wikipedia is uh, it, it means something about human rights, it means something about access to information, access to knowledge, um, that we would never compromise on censorship, and we've stuck with that very firmly through all these years. Google, quite famously, uh, made the decision to go into China and to compromise with censorship in China. Um, I was critical of that decision, as were a lot of people, um, although I would say in fairness to Google, uh, they always uh, made the argument that they were in China uh, trying to be a positive force for change. I think that the question of whether or not companies should be doing business in China, particularly media companies, uh, particularly internet media companies, which have to deal with the question of citizen participation, whether or not you should be doing business in China is very similar to the question of whether or not we should be doing, whether we should have been doing business in apartheid South Africa. And I think that reasonable people can differ. Uh, one approach is to say, no, we can't be there at all, we're going to boycott, we can't participate at all. 
The other approach is to say we're going to be there, but we're going to go in under a set of principles that allows us to be a positive force for change. Google did the latter. I didn't agree with them, but I did say it's a, it's a point where reasonable people can differ. And what I've always said is that we need to hold Google's feet to the fire. When push comes to shove, what are they really going to do? Are they really there because they're trying to be a positive force for change? Or are they just there to make money? Well, as it turns out, uh, quite famously recently, Google has decided to pull out of China. Uh, and they decided to pull out of China when they felt that they could no longer participate in what was going on there. So I'm very proud of Google. Uh, some people have been cynical about them pulling out, saying, well, they were not winning in China anyway, so what does it really cost them? Uh, the truth is, Google's market share in China had gotten up to about 35%. Uh, I don't know how many companies would kill uh, to get 35% of the Chinese market. So it is a significant step that Google has taken. Um, and I think it's really important for their brand in the long run. I think it's really important for China in the long run that people are willing to stand up and say, this is a human rights issue. You can no longer uh, treat your citizens in this way. Uh, we aren't talking about some marginal filtering of highly questionable terrorist information. We're talking about filtering mainstream criticism of the government. This is no longer acceptable. Um, well, so we pay a price for this. Uh, the interesting thing about our situation in China is that we are now accessible in China. Uh, I've gone over, I uh, visited the minister, he's come to visit me, we have a little friendly diplomacy back and forth. And we got to a place which was interesting in a way. We don't filter at all, and we don't participate in censorship at all. However, we can't stop China from participating, I mean from them doing it. We can't, it's their network, it's their firewall, uh, they can block certain things. But what they've done is they filter the pages they don't like. So certain things like Tiananmen Square or Falun Gong, uh, certain pages discussing the question of the status of Taiwan. These are very touchy issues within China, and they filter those pages. Uh, the rest of Wikipedia is, is completely accessible in China. What's interesting about that is that we managed to get to the same place that Google got to, but without getting our hands dirty. We were in China, but we uh, are filtered in China. Google was in China, but filtered in China. The difference is Google had to participate. Now Google's pulled out of China, now they're, they're broadcasting their Chinese language site from Hong Kong, and currently, um, and who knows what's going to happen in the future, currently they're now in the same position we are, which is their, their Chinese language site coming from Hong Kong is fully uncensored, it's a complete normal Google. Within China, though, the Chinese government is blocking certain search results and certain things. So it's an interesting development, and I think it'll be very interesting to see how this emerges over the next few years. I think that China uh, has begun to understand that their approach to filtering the internet is no longer tenable, um, and uh, they are changing, but we'll see. Well, so anyway, so we've been blocked in China, we're only number 62 in China, we're not nearly as famous in China, it's the one place I go where I can meet college students who've never heard of Wikipedia, uh, but nonetheless we've had a cultural impact in China of sorts. Um, here's a menu someone sent me from Beijing. <laughs> Wikipedia, fraud, with eggs. Uh, so, what the hell is this? Uh, here's another one, also from Beijing. Be brisket in Wikipedia flavor. <laughs> There's a Wikipedia bread company in Dalian, China. I was in, I was in Dalian and somebody brought me some bread from a Wikipedia bread company. It was quite good. Um, so somebody said to me, uh, that, you know, I, I started getting these. People sent me the, these emails. Somebody emailed me one and they said, excuse me, what does this mean? And I said, I have no idea. Stir fry Wikipedia. I like the spicy stir fry with the with pimentos. But I said, well, I know who will know. Um, I went, we have a Chinese board member, uh, Ting, and I said to Ting, I said, what does this mean? And he said, Jimmy, I have no idea. <laughs> Nobody really knows what this is all about. The only thing that we've managed to figure out is that uh, some, you know, right before the Olympics, they, they needed to translate a lot of the menus into English because a lot of foreigners were coming. Uh, so we think that, that somebody was tasked at different restaurants, oh, you need to translate the menu, they didn't really know English. Uh, and they said, uh, you know, what is this kind of thing? And somebody says, I don't know, go and look at Wikipedia. And they said, oh, e That's our only thing. So, no idea. Steam eggs in Wikipedia, my favorite. So the last thing I'm going to do, uh, it's a really fun kind of thing, is global content comparisons. I just, I, I throw this in. Uh, because I think it's a really uh, interesting slide. A lot of people say, you know, we've got Wikipedia in all these languages all around the world. How does it differ around the world? In terms of the content, in terms of what's written in Wikipedia, it's very, very similar around the world. But we do see differences in the traffic patterns from the readers. So this is, uh, we did a study of uh, the 100 most popular pages in Wikipedia 
in several different languages around the world. So we have here English, Chinese, Japanese, French, German, uh, Russian, and Spanish. Um, and in each of these, you can see what, which, which category, which type of article is the most popular. So the first thing that jumps out at you is uh, Japanese. Look at the green, the big green line, pop culture. So if you know anything about Japan, this makes perfect sense. Uh, the Japanese love pop culture. Uh, they're really fanatical about it. They love English pop culture. They love Japanese homegrown pop culture. Uh, it's perfectly normal that, that this would be the most popular thing in Japan. Um, another thing I noticed is that the, the Germans are the most interested in geography. Not sure if that's a good thing. I hope, I hope most of the Germans didn't make it. Just, just kidding. But it is true. They, they do. And in fact, it, it is actually very interesting. The Germans are very interested in the geography history. The German Wikipedia is the highest quality Wikipedia. Uh, and they're very, uh, you know, true to stereotype, I suppose, but the Germans are very uh, intense about quality and they're very academic. They're very passionately uh, academic Wikipedia. Um, and then the last thing you notice is that sex is uh, popular in, in every uh, language, uh, well, except for French and Spanish. I was a little puzzled by this until somebody explained to me because the French and the Spanish are actually having sex. Uh, whereas the rest of us are all just reading about it. So, well, that's the end of my uh, prepared remarks. Uh, and now we're going to have uh, some questions. Thank you. Jimmy, thank you very much. I have just confessed being one of those people to put my hand up. Well, who did it put my hand up? I have not had an editor's Wikipedia. But I was fascinated to be told about my short entry that somebody who read it was really delighted to know that I had a very fit younger son who was suddenly of a hero. It was only later I learned that my younger son had an editor's Wikipedia. <laughs> very effectively. Anyhow, we'd love to have your questions. First of all, to put these devices to the test, we have a trick question to do with spelling. So could you please tell us what is the correct spelling of the Icelandic volcano with the wall rain fork through to get here today? I actually have an answer, yes. I read it this morning. Then it must be right. We're counting that now.
written word, uh, it's going to have a huge impact. Um, Will it always be a force to do? No, not always. Uh, but that's such as the nature of communication uh, in general. Uh, I think that um, there is no question that we will see uh, both uh, some fabulous, uh, wonderful, amazing uh, revolutions where uh, uh, tyrants are overthrown uh, through peaceful demonstrations organized spontaneously on Twitter. That's going to happen. It's already happened to some extent in some places. Um, we're also going to see uh, some riots start through misinformation that comes over Twitter um, and some panics caused because people didn't pause to stop and find out if it's true or not. Uh, so any kind of communication obviously is going to have uh, all kinds of different impacts. So I suppose if everybody can turn up in a certain place to dance on the stage and platform or whatever, they can equally turn up. Yeah, we've seen some very strange things uh, in China actually so far of uh, uh, message boards, very large public message boards, deciding that some person had done something wrong, and then literally thousands of people harass that person. Um, it's really quite unpleasant. Um, okay. uh, can we have some questions from the audience, please? Down here, thank you. Do you have some microphones about the place? Yes. Try, try using your your pad. The microphone on there. <laughs> okay. English speakers and can function in English. 
Um, however, we also have uh, many uh, projects in the Indian languages, uh, from uh, you know, Bengali is pretty big, Hindi is big. Uh, we, you know, it's a whole a whole group of languages there with a really passionate community who are, are avidly working on those things. So, what are some of the challenges uh, for us in India? Um, many people in India have keyboard entry problems. Those have gotten better over time. The ability to write on an English keyboard in Hindi is not. A lot of people in the past didn't even know how to do it, and so now that's beginning to change. Um, and so one of the things that we're looking at is usability, just simple usability. When people come to Wikipedia uh, in, in various languages, do they have the software they need? How can we help them get the software they need in order to be able to edit uh, in a comfortable way? What can we change about the website? So we're starting to put some resources towards that. Um, we just got our first board member from India. so. Uh, Vishakha uh, Dada is a filmmaker from uh, Delhi, uh, and she's just showing the board. I'm um, hoping that she'll give us more. I mean, it's been pretty pathetic, actually, that all our board members, I'm like the Indian expert, because I've been there eight times, right? Frankly, you can go to India a lot more than eight times and still not understand India. It's quite a complex place. Um, and so we're trying to gain some expertise in that area. And in India, in particular, it's one of the places we are uh, going to have a pilot project in next year. Uh, to have actual people on the ground. And so I think a, a large part of the focus of people on the ground in India is going to be uh, software usability. But the other part is simply uh, PR, uh, simply communications, making sure that, um, that the Indian press is aware that we have a local group and that they can talk to the, the local group. And not just the English language newspapers, but all the languages uh, that they can write about Wikipedia in their language and that it exists in their language. So that generally when people find out uh, it's surprising how many people, you know, they, they're, they're using the English Wikipedia all the time and they have no idea that they have a talent with Wikipedia. They just don't know uh, until somebody tells them and they're very excited. They're like, oh wow, check this out, this is amazing. Uh, so it's, a lot of it's about communication. So I, I go to India as often as I can uh, simply because, uh, well, I'm completely useless, but it's in the newspaper when I go to India. So I have to go there and, and try to help get the best coverage. Thank you, Jimmy. We've got some questions coming in. By text. So the message behind a few of them seems to be how sanguine are you about the fact that, that what we're getting on Wikipedia is opinion rather than information sometimes? Um, so I, I think that we are surprisingly good uh, in this regard. And, and the way that we ensure the accuracy of information, uh, it, it's a complicated social system, but we have a poor community of a few thousand really active users. <coughs> Uh, a large number of them are administrators. Administrators have the ability to block pages. They have the ability to block people from editing if they're misbehaving. And we have a huge set of policies. I and mean, you can spend your life reading policies in Wikipedia uh, relating to uh, references, relating to neutrality. Um, and a lot of it's just very old fashioned. Uh, you know, the, the idea is uh, you can't just come, if you just come to Wikipedia and just start writing your random opinions, the community will delete it almost instantly. They just they find that to be uh, they'll say, where's the source? Where's the reference? Oh, what is the source? Um, we care about quality sourcing. So, for example, um, we're very suspicious about blogs as sources. That doesn't say we will never use a blog as a source, but I think our standards about when to use a blog as a source are not really materially different from, say, the BBC or the New York Times. We just treat it with a great deal of caution. Uh, you know, if you have a famous politician who's blogging about their own position, that's a pretty good source. If you have a random blogger complaining about something, um, well, where do they get their information? Things like that. So um, that's you know that's the core of it is is having a really passionate community um, who cares about quality. Thank you. I can take one more question from you a minute. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, Jimmy. Um, I was obviously you know excited that you're here today. It's Terry Allen from uh, uh, Freedom International and Digital. Um, I was particularly impressed, I must say, when I was at breakfast uh, uh, this morning in the hotel, open page, page two, FT, and there's your name, a little, uh, <laughs> a little uh, edit there of uh, how you arrived here. Um, speed to market, um, in terms of getting information to market for brands, in particular, say, for example, for Wikipedia, maybe you could explain a little bit how you address that issue, because when you're dealing with information that's sometimes quite sensitive, speed to market is crucial, but you do have to at the same time um, you know, care about that. 
Um, yeah, so I'm going to interpret your question because I'm not exactly sure what you're asking, but um, 